All right, everybody, are we excited? We have a MacBook here. The customer says it's not turning on. And we have a unique opportunity here to do something that we almost never do, which is actually fix the MacBook. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to unplug the battery so that we can see how much power the board is taking by itself. We are going to get the power supply software on the screen, and we are going to commence with figuring out what is wrong with this MacBook. So let's get the power on the power supply. See what we get. We have, we're getting 0 0.009 amps. Now, for those of you who follow my wiki or who follow my videos, what is it that causes an issue where it's only taking 0 0.09 amps and you get no green light? Uh, for those of you wondering, uh, if, if you were to say that's not documented in any of your prior videos, so I have no way of telling you that, and it's not in your wiki, you, that, that is the correct answer. That indeed is not in my wiki and is not in any of my prior videos. So let's take this out of the machine and see if we can find any hints and figure out how to make this MacBook work again. So first thing I like to do with any of these machines, before I try to use my brain, I like to look around the board and see if I can find anything. So can you guys find anything? Do you see anything here? Do you see anything if we were to zoom a little bit more? All right, what do you see? So first thing that I see, I don't know if you see it, over there, that looks like something. And we're going to find that something. Ah, what's that? That's a JTAG with two pins on the left that look a little bit more burned than the pins on the right. Okay, that's strange. That's a little strange over there. What is that? So this is a JTAG connector. Now there's three pins. I, I can't tell if that's like some sort of red drink or rust or crap. Yeah, it does look like corrosion. So what I want to do here is I want to see what those three pins that are corroded are actually for. So we have ground. That doesn't really matter. We have pp 3 v 4 2 That's very important. That's the power rail required to get a green light. Have the SMC turn on. Everything work. And then we have this SPI MOSI which is going to be a method that I can, yeah, this is, if I want to program the BIOS through the JTAG connector, then that, that's important. But it's, now it could technically mean that somehow if there was a shock through there, maybe a shock went to my BIOS, and my BIOS could be bad, but I'm not really counting on that. I'm not really, I don't think that's going to be the core of my problem. The core of my problem is pp 3 4 2 underscore g 3 hot not being present. So let's uh, kind of create a theory or model for the board based on that. So we're going to plug this in, as I did before, and we're going to take some measurements. The first measurement I'm going to take is a voltage measurement of pp 3 4 2 underscore g 3 hot the power required to get the green light and the charger so that everything turns on, as noted in my videos on the one-wire circuit, which still hold true to the MacBook Air. And we have 3.4 volts. We have 3.4 volts, but there's no light. So now the next question is obviously going to be, why? So now, pp 3 v 4 2 underscore g 3 hot one sec, my DC inboard plug connector just came out a little bit. Just get you plugged back in. All right. So over here, we got this. So, what? 3.4. Now the next question is going to be, is my system management controller turning on and speaking with the one-wire circuit over here? So the one-wire circuit is going to be these two chips on the DC inboard. That's going to allow the charger to speak to the SMC. But obviously, I want to know if my SMC is turning on. Now, in older videos, I've gone over have a, the SMC Reset L circuit. This is the system management controller. It's going to speak with the charger. And it does need to turn on. And SMC Reset L is 1.1 volts. Now, that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Let's, let's, let's uh, take a look on the schematic and board view over here. And so I can show you why that is a problem. So, the system management controller over here, this is the chip that is going to speak to the charger. So, in order for, ever, for the charger to work, there is a line called Sys1 wire. Let's zoom in on that for you. Sys1 wire is going to be one of the ones usually on the left. It may have been changed because this is an error. Here, so here we go. So, Sys1 wire. Sys1 wire. See, this is the line that's going to go to the DC inboard that's eventually going to go to the charger. Sys1 wire speaks to the SMC. This is the SMC. Now, for this chip to turn on, it needs to be getting its reset signal. And SMC reset L is going to be what's required to get you your reset signal. SMC reset L. Now, why do we have a reset signal? 
Well, this is kind of like the reset button on the front of your desktop PC. When you press the reset button, the computer resets itself. It starts from scratch, everything that's in memory gets purged, and then it begins the boot process anew. Now, that's what the reset signal does. Now, the purpose of having this reset signal here is it's going to keep the SMC from turning on until you let go of the reset button. You let go of the reset button when the signal is high. Remember, it's the SMC is going to be reset when it's underscore L, meaning low, meaning low voltage. This signal over here is pulled up to 3.42 volts by a pull-up resistor. You have PP3421 underscore G3 hot here going to R5100. That is going to pull this up to 3.42 volts, which is what I expect it to be. This chip is going to pull it down. Now, why is this chip pull it down? That's a great question. This chip, the SMC, wants to be powered off of PP3V42. It's powered off of that 3.42 volt power line. Now, when the system is first turning on, the 3.42 volt power line is going to take, you know, maybe 100, 200 milliseconds, I don't know exactly how long, to stabilize. It's going to take a little bit of time to stabilize. And while it's stabilizing, if the SMC is trying to turn itself on before it has the proper power, it's going to crash. So the system management controller is not going to turn on until the SMC reset L chip says, okay, now turn on. So it keeps that reset signal low so that the SMC doesn't try to turn on until PP3042 underscore G3 hot is the proper voltage. It's exactly 3.42 volts or somewhere around there. So let's see why that is pulled down. Now there are a couple of things that can pull SMC reset L down. Behind door number one, SMC reset L can be pulled down by the actual SMC reset L chip, U5100. Behind door number two, SMC reset L can be pulled down because R5100 is corroded. Again, this would be a preference. Behind door number three, the SMC chip that has 96 teeny tiny 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 balls could be what is um, what is pulling it down because the SMC chip is is bad or, or died, which is something that we don't we don't want that we don't want that yeah, because then you have to find another SMC you have to reball it. I don't even know if I have an SMC to this anymore. I don't know where my where my uh, jig for it is because I used to have a jig for this that we would kind of share amongst all the staff. And now I think that that belongs to Paul or Chris or Dan and is on their desk. So over here you can see that the SMC Reset L resistor looks beautiful. There is, that, that resistor is as pretty as can be. There is nothing wrong with it. I could tell where that resistor is, by the way. Using Paul Daniels' excellent software, which is available on pldaniels.com. is life-changing if you're in this industry. You just right-click R5100. It shows you it right in the screen. If you right-click a signal, it shows you everywhere that signal shows up in the board. If you're using Landrex Testlink, get rid of that shit today. Head over to pldaniels.com and buy the BoardView software. It is genuinely worth it. It is, it is amazing stuff. I am not paid to say that. I just like the software. And if any of you have used Landrex, which has not been updated since 1995, you would understand why I'm saying that. Yes, that's right. The alternative to this software is a piece of shit that has not been updated since 1995. So it's, it's, not like a, it's not like there's really a high bar set for the Paul Daniel software there. Now, what do you see when you look at this chip? See that? That is a chip that has seen corrosion. That is clear as day. And this is one of the things that, you, that it makes it very difficult to hire board repair people or people in this industry. One of the things that makes it really hard to hire in this industry is that you need to have a certain eye for things. Because you could work all day long to try to figure shit out, but at the end of the day, what's really going to, 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 to set you apart is if you can tell where corrosion is. Because if you can, then all that circuit stuff I'm telling you about, all that stuff winds up being just kind of extra. You know, really what, what matters, what is going to change your uh, effective rate, uh, your, your rate of success in figuring out board problems is being able to see that type of corrosion and recognize it immediately. And uh, the, it, it's really kind of difficult to do because sometimes it can look like dust and sometimes it can look like something else. But as you can see on the left side of that chip, that QFN is not as pretty as other QFNs are. So if I show you another QFN on this board, you'll notice that the other QFNs are not nearly as pretty. I mean, they're more pretty. Yeah, more pretty is the word I'm looking for. So let's say we take a look at the ISL6259 chip down here. So that is actually considerably cleaner. See? That is a pretty QFN right there. That's beautiful.
That's nice. I like this QFN. That's a pretty QFN. But then when you look over here at this, that is not a pretty QFN. Now, there's two possibilities here. Behind door number one, just a little bit of flux and reflow will get rid of that corrosion and this chip is fine, or door number two, the chip itself is bad. Or door number three, I'm barking up the wrong tree and that's just dust and I'm really just looking for an easy victory. But, <laughs> and, I, and I looked at the wrong place. But we're gonna hope it's, we're gonna hope it just, it solves itself with a little bit of good old fashioned Amtec flux. So that is some Amtec NC559 V2 TF Flux available at store.rossmangroup.com. We still have hot air rework stations on sale if you use the special code at checkout, 19PLD73. That's 19PLD73 for a discount on an Atten 862 hot air rework station. All right, so take a look at this. This, this is a T30KN uh, tip. I have a link in the description down below. If you didn't notice, this entire video is just one long ad. One gigantic ad. If Linus can pull it off, then why can't I? We're gonna shill until the cows come home. All right, so this, no, but seriously, I actually, I've been using the soldering iron tip for about six or seven years. It's a T30-KN. Uh, there's an Amazon link below, but you can actually buy it cheaper usually on, uh, on almost any other website than Amazon. Because Amazon, usually when I start uh, shilling these things, the Amazon vendors uh, jack up the price of, of all of it because they, they know they can get the money. So you, you can usually find this stuff cheaper if you search around. Like all spec may have it cheaper and stuff like that. But this T30KN tip is really nice for being able to get around that area like that. It's really good for doing QFNs. It's this nice knife shaped tip. It goes to the FM2032 iron. See the, see the shape of it? It's just, it's perfect for getting inside those QFNs. And we, let me, You thought wrong, that dude. You thought wrong. I bet you thought that you should sell ICLN at 24 bucks because it was going to crash down before recovering back up to an all-time high. Yeah, yep. You probably thought that too, didn't you? Oh. I thought that too. I said. Okay, so do a little bit of that. Now, I'm going to see if it gives us a green light and turns on. And if it does, I'll be quite happy. Decker, you most certainly can. I have hands that shake all the time and I still do this on a regular basis, so don't let that get you down. Okay, so we do this, and as you can see, we get a green light. Unfortunately, the green light, it, it's not really doing much for us because we're still stuck at 19 milliamps. Now, 19 milliamps can be indicative of a BIOS problem, or 11 milliamps, damn. So we're going to have a little bit more, a little bit more work to do here. So ne next up is going to be just, just for shits and giggles, we are going to rip off this horrid JTAG connector over here, because remember I was talking about the BIOS area, not the BIOS area, but a JTAG connector allows you to reprogram the BIOS, having what looked like rust around it, which means that something bad went there. Luckily, I don't think something too terrible could go there because the pin for the BIOS is right next to a 3.42 to 3 volt line. And most of the signaling in this machine is done on 3.3 volts. So if 3.4 volts goes to a 3.3 volt line, it's not the end of the world. But I don't want there to be rust and shit corrosion over there. So we get rid of that JTAG connector. We toss it off the board. It is as non-essential as Andrew Cuomo is to New York City. And we are going to see if we can get this to turn on now after removing that very non-essential piece. I'm kind of thinking every time I remove a non-essential piece of the board of calling it a Kuoma. Just going to wick the pads, keep it nice and neat. And after removing the JTAG connector, you may notice that we have fan spin! Look at that! This JTAG connector can often keep the board from working. And it's something that I made sure to mention in the wiki, just for anybody who's uh, ever curious. And, you know, 
Uh, I am just to be clear. I'm going to be doing a lot less of the border pair videos because nobody watches them. Like literally, nobody watches them, and a lot more focus on the wiki site here. So I like doing these border pair videos as a way of teaching people how to do the how to get into doing this stuff. Since uh, a lot of this instructional content wasn't around when I started, and it would have made my life a lot easier. And what I've realized is, A, I've already done a bunch of them, and B, uh, nobody watches them. So I have been focusing much more on my wiki, which is here to try and make it easier for you to figure out how to do this stuff. Um, but it, it, should, it, it makes it so that you can kind of, you can find the stuff on your own. Advice for anyone wanting to get an e-bike or bike. Don't get a pre-built one because the pre-built ones are horrible. You're going to have to build it yourself. You're going to have to put it together yourself. It's really just a... Uh, I, I like the phase runner controller. I would check out Grin, uh, ebikes.ca. Even if you wind up paying a teeny tiny bit more money at ebikes.ca than you would through another vendor, it's, it's worth it, in my opinion, because you get a product from a company that will actually help you if there's any sort of problem, if they think you're buying something that you shouldn't be buying. Like it, it, they're a company that will support you throughout the entire process. So... I think that you should check out ebikes.ca, e-b-i-k-e-s.ca, even if you wind up paying a little bit more for shipping. Again, I don't get paid to say this, to be clear. I'm not getting paid to say this. They have not given me any special discounts. That They, or they haven't given me any discounts, actually. Uh, I pay retail every time I go there. I just like companies that, uh, that, that care about what they do, that are involved in the community, and uh, ebikes.ca is one of those companies, so I would check them out and ask any questions you have, ask them. They'll probably, they'll probably take the time to give you an answer instead of just tell you to go fuck yourself. So check out ebikes.ca. This is the wiki. This is where I am putting most of my focus. So if you wanted to learn about this on this particular model, 13-inch, 2015, 2016, A1466, there is one section of the wiki where it says, any board level issue at all, look at J6100 and feel guilt-free in killing it. See? See that right there? Any board level issue at all, look at J6100 and feel guilt-free and killing it. So there, there were two issues here. The first was we did not have a green light. So let's just scroll up to that. No green or orange light in the charger. SMC reset L low due to bad SMC. SMC reset L corroded, uh, low due to bad R5115 or bad U5100. So U5100. So if you wanted to solve this board level problem, rather than having to go through a list of six or seven hundred videos and listen to my voice throughout the entire thing, which is highly aggravating, what you'll be able to do in the future is go to this wiki and find all of it. So pretty much any piece of information that is inside the head of myself or one of my employees is going here. We have an internal company chat where I am getting everybody who works here, every time they fix a board, every time they think of something, they put it in there and they log it in a particular format that makes it easy for me to post it here. The idea is all of the institutional knowledge of Rossman Repair Group should at some point be here and be made public. It should not be stuck in our brains. It should be here for all of you to see. I'm do Again, I'm, I'm working on this just because, as I said, the board repair videos, A, I, I'm honestly starting to get bored of doing them. B, most of you are bored of watching them on a channel with 1.3 million subscribers. They get 8,000 views. And uh, C, I think this is a far more... How do I put this? I think this is a far more... Uh, easier to access, easel, easier to index than just me saying, here are 600 videos, some of which are 30 to 50 minutes long, have fun. That's, that's a way to get introduced to it, but this is also a way, it's kind of like a more flashcard, more cheat sheet way to get into the concept of board repair and learn everything, and hopefully this, um, hopefully this, this helps you all out. Uh, that's about it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something. Uh, I'm going to finish this border pair up and uh, we'll see you later and hopefully that that, that that helps you over here and what also what I'm trying to add to this when I see little pieces of corrosion I'm not just trying to give you the I'm not just trying to show you up here when it's taking this many amps you have this problem check this area I really want to teach you all how to be able to tell when something is corroded or when you should care. So over here, I'm trying to teach you, here is when you should not care about a pro point, here is where it doesn't really matter, uh, but like here, here's a pro point that conducts but will die. Here's a pro point that's perfect. Here is one that's just genuinely bad. This is not conducting and this is not passing anything at all. Here is a pro point that looks bad but actually ha is conducting. 
here's a probe point that looks better, but is actually conducting less. Like, I'm trying to get you to, ha when you see a board, see the same things that I see. Because all of the electronics knowledge and all of the, all of the stuff on, you know, here's what this signal means and here's the, how a buck converter works and this, that, and the other. Honestly, doing this type of work is less valuable than just the ability to see with your eyes what's going on. So, you know, for instance, here is a, like, corrosion under a BGA package. This was an SMC that was actually missing balls. Someone here was not able to see it. And, you know, so every time someone here is not able to see something that I can see, I'm adding it to this because I don't want, I want, like, Ross Vision to not be just a, you know, a, a, a patented product of, a, a, a patented proprietary product of Rossman Repair Group. I want Ross Vision to be something that everybody can develop. Ross Vision. I can't believe I just named some after myself. That that's that's a egomaniacal thing to do. But yeah, Ross Vision. I like it. Ross Vision. So here you have little teeny tiny bits of green growing on a chip over here. Uh, here you've got a bad soldering job. Here you have a soldering job where it's a little bit depleted. You don't have a, it all done. Here you have a probe point to the other side of the board uh, where I think PPV RTC G3 hot is going to go. That's probably going to be corroded and destroyed. Here you just have at one point, uh, you know, th this is one of the things with on the job learning, by the way. So someone who had been, I, I did my best with on the job learning. After about two months, this got left on a board. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm, for those of you who ask why am I not exactly super excited for the concept of the, uh, of a, uh, Hiring and on-the-job learning, it's <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah. So I, I really try to put as much information out as humanly possible uh, on here uh, so that people have as much chance to learn as humanly possible on their own from all this stuff rather than from, you know, like when I'm, when I'm paying them over it. Uh, and that's about that for today, so that's it. And as always, I hope you learned something. I'll see you all in the next video. Bye now. God forgive me.